Howdy folks, my name is Sean and I'll be the mysterious voice behind this video presentation. Megan and I co-direct the Stan Creek Regional Archaeology Project, or SCRAP, with our work currently focused on the ancient Maya town site of Alabama. You'll see a map of downtown Alabama later in the presentation. We've run workshops on archaeological illustration before, and we're excited when Sylvia proposed that we pull together a short recorded presentation on the subject. Illustration is one of those skills, along with proper note-taking and photography, that is absolutely fundamental in archaeology. It doesn't matter what role you have on an archaeological project, whether you're a laborer, a student, a volunteer, or a director, whether you're in the field or in the lab, whether you're working on front-end data collection or preparing materials for publication or presentation, you will be producing drawn images of various types and for various purposes. Archaeologists draw. That is just a fact. And yet, archaeological illustration is one of those skills that we don't tend to talk about. Most projects, while they are constantly engaged in making drawings, rarely take the time to discuss this production in a coherent manner. Most students will never take a class or even a short workshop about illustration. It just seems to be one of those skills that you pick up as you go along. But here's the thing. Unlike with art, aesthetic considerations are usually secondary in archaeological illustration. If you've ever flipped through a scholarly report or book on archaeology, you've probably noticed that the illustrations included tend to be a far cry from those you might see in a publication like National Geographic. Heck, some can be downright ugly. The reason for this is not that all archaeologists are hopeless at drawing. The reason is because archaeological illustration is a tool. There are specific rules for archaeological illustration that are relatively consistent across the discipline, whether you're working in Belize or Malta, Egypt or Australia. And aesthetic considerations are of secondary importance to consistent adherence to these rules. We'll talk about some of these as we go along. Ready? Set? Go! Now there are three considerations that drive decision making when it comes to archaeological illustration. And these are pretty self-evident, so we'll go through them relatively quickly. First, we have to be conscious of our audience. As you'll see, the kinds of drawings we do for ourselves, as internal documents within a project, tend to be very different from those we might produce for a scholarly article or report. They're different again from what we might produce to look good on a big screen for a presentation. And they're different yet again from something produced for a popular audience, say for a museum, film, or popular article, where aesthetic choices and artistic skills are more important. Second, the purpose of the illustration is key. As we'll talk about in a bit, we're generally not attempting to capture a 100% accurate representation of an object or site in every detail. That is what photographs and 3D scans are for. We're trying to highlight specific pieces of evidence that our audience might be interested in. Illustration is an act of interpretation. Finally, the technology that we're engaging with matters, on both the production and presentation end of the equation. Most of our drawings are done with old-fashioned pencil and paper, and digitized on a computer or tablet later. Others are drawn directly on a digital device. While color images are becoming more common in professional publication, particularly when we're talking about artifact illustration, so stone tools, pottery, and the like, the conventions that we follow were developed for black and white publication, and to remain stable as they are copied over and over and over again, and they've just kind of stuck around. All right, moving on. There are three types of illustration that archeologists are likely to engage in. Figures, maps, and artifact illustration. The first category of drawing is a broad one that we can generally refer to as figures. Figures are usually simplified drawings meant to convey an idea or concept. They could be something like this image of a human skeleton. No human looks exactly like this. This is an idealized picture meant to illustrate the general form and placement of different bones in the human body. 
In this case, these are idealized drawings of Maya temple structures from several different sites scattered across the Maya area, distinguishing between platforms in yellow and superstructures in white, and showing some of the variability in form and scale. In this case, the image is intended to convey the basic shape of the ancient Maya cosmos, with the world of the living in orange above a nine-tiered or nine-layered underworld in gray and below a 13-layered upper world in blue, joined together by the world tree, in this case represented by an element from a panel on Palenque's Temple of the Cross. This simplified image illustrates the concept of an oblique aerial photograph, while this simplified image illustrates the concept of a vertical aerial photograph. And this rather quirky image was intended to accompany discussion of a well-publicized disagreement between two foundational figures within anthropology for one of my graduate classes. For those folks that are more artistically inclined than I am, those reconstruction or interpretive drawings that you may be familiar with from the uh, explorer Frederick Catherwood or from the pages of National Geographic would fit here as well. And check out some of the classic work from epigrapher and archaeologist Tatiana Proskuryakov uh, to see some other uh, examples of archaeologically accurate and unquestionably beautiful reconstruction. The point is that within the category of figures, there's an awful lot of variability, most of which is related to the first two of the factors that we discussed earlier, the purpose of the illustration and the intended audience. Perhaps the most common form of illustration encountered in archaeology are maps. If a publication has only one image in it, you can pretty much guarantee that image will be a map. Archaeological data consists of things in time and space, and archaeologists are obsessed with recording the spatial relationship of things for posterity and presentation. Our notebooks and paperwork are full of maps, as are our reports and publications, both professional and popular. The scale and detail of these maps vary, again, according to the purpose and the audience. While considerable artistry can be found in a good map, as they are primarily intended to reliably convey specific spatial information, they also tend to adhere to some basic conventions that allow for those familiar with how to read them to get the most out of them. For instance, in this case, this map of the Caribbean uses the expected blue for water, with shallower water colored a lighter shade, and tan for land, with higher ground colored in a darker shade. In this case, a map of Belize is being colored to highlight the various districts of the country, with other land and water faded to gray because they're less important for the purpose. Here, on this map showing the locations of sites close to the popular tourist cave, Octuntuna Chilmacnall, distinct levels in elevation are marked by orange contour lines. Gray lines plot the course of the Roaring Creek. Complex black shapes outline the downtown cores of some of the region's principal sites, connected by lines representing roads. And other symbols indicate the locations of other, smaller, surface sites and caves. And still other maps, like this one of downtown Alabama, present an idealized interpretation of architecture at the site and allow one to evaluate the relative size, orientation, and position of various buildings. Because all site maps across the Maya area follow the same general rules, if you know what you're looking at, you can readily identify different types of building based on how they are represented. This, for instance, is the ball court at Alabama, an important type of building that no ancient site of any significance could go without. And of course, cave sites have their own conventions for similar purposes, with the level of detail varying according to the size of the cave in question. For small caves like Kui Chen in the lower left, located along the upper McCall River, we were able to represent the entirety of the cave in relatively fine detail. For big caves, like Lubulha or Waterfall Cave located in the Caves Branch, we've highlighted two areas of particular interest along the two kilometer long main passage. 
And of course, maps aren't just about representing spatial information. They're an opportunity to interrogate it. In this case, we are interested in understanding how people may have moved along the streets and alleys of Teotihuacan, a massive ancient city located in central Mexico. The image on the right um, has red lines indicating areas that we suggest would have been particularly busy. And then, finally, there's artifact illustration. Arguably, this can be the most technically difficult kind of illustration that an archaeologist is likely to engage in on a regular basis, and is the most tightly constrained by established convention. But why illustrate at all we, when we can simply take photographs of the things we're interested in? Back in the day, one of the main reasons that archaeologists drew pictures of the things we found was because it was really expensive to publish photographs, and they didn't copy very well. Now, that's not so much of an issue today, of course. Um, the real reason that we still tend to draw select artifacts, particularly for publication, is that drawings are organized to present information different from what a photograph can offer. For instance, in this case, while this photograph of a polychrome dish recovered from a tomb at the site of Cajal Pech in San Ignacio works really well for conveying the general form of the vessel, its colors, and some of the interesting design painted on its surface, with the drawing, we're able to roll out the image so that it can be viewed in its entirety, all in one image. With this, you can appreciate subtle differences in the way that the two reclining figures are represented. You can also get some idea of how the dish was made by observing the left-hand side of the drawing. Here, an imaginary slice has been cut out of the pot, something you'd never do just to get a photograph, to better show the curves and thickness of different parts of the vessel. This kind of information can be invaluable to an archaeologist that is attempting to understand sometimes subtle differences in vessel form from one example to another one site to another, or one time to another. Similarly, in the case of this stone point, perhaps once used as a knife, found on the campus of Set in San Ignacio, while the photo works really well to convey the qualities of the material and the general shape of the object, there's a lot of other information that might be of interest to an archaeologist that is not visible. With a drawing, however, we are able to highlight each scar that shows where, and with a strike in which direction, an ancient Maya stoneworker removed material to make this beautiful object. It carries a lot of information. Finally, going back to identifying the purpose of the illustration, we should distinguish between the working or reference illustrations that we make in the field, um, usually in pencil and paper and usually covered with a liberal smear of mud, from those finished drawings that we're producing for publication and presentation. Many of the drawings that we make on a daily basis are of the muddy kind. These are working illustrations, usually meant to do little more than remind us of important information also recorded in notes and photographs. Archaeologists love nothing more than redundancy. These aren't always pretty, but they are important, as they form part of the permanent record of our activities on an archaeological site. They are intended not only for our reference, but for other scholars to follow. Of course, some of the drawings that we do in the field find their way into publications with little change, save their cleaning up. The plans and profiles that document the various contexts and relationships identified through our excavations are perhaps the most prevalent example of this. Now, the last real thing that we should chat about are some of the conventions that you'll see when looking at archaeological drawings, particularly when we're talking about artifacts. Each kind of object has its own particularities, and the act of drawing, in many ways, is much more akin to drafting than art. To do these, you have to make careful observations of the objects that you are drawing and take measurements after measurement after measurement. 
Even if you don't consider yourself to be a good drawer, once you understand the conventions, you can make a serviceable drawing. I, for instance, don't have the eye to do really beautiful lithic drawings, but either of those on the slide would work just fine for a publication or presentation. If you're interested in seeing what an artistic hand can bring to the table, check out some of the drawings in the sources suggested at the end of the video, or check out the Googles. Just a few things to mention with respect to lithics or chipped stone artifacts. These are artifacts produced by removing predictable flakes from really uniform material, materials like chert or flint or obsidian. First, these are generally black and white line drawings. Facets indicating where flakes had been removed during the making of the point, such as here and here, are outlined with solid lines. The short curving lines in these areas indicate the direction from which flakes were removed. They kind of curve around the point of impact, and so one can tell from the drawing that the flakes were removed in the directions indicated by the arrows. We can reconstruct how it was made. Cool, eh? Another type of stone artifact is referred to as ground stone by archaeologists. By this, we mean that the stone is shaped not through the removal of flakes, but principally through grinding or abrading or pecking or carving. Ground stone objects include things like manos and matates or, or grinding stones, objects of jade, or stone statues like those in the drawings on the slide, all from around the Cayo area, by the way. These are black and white drawings as well, made up of thousands and thousands of tiny dots, no lines. Shading is accomplished by varying the density of dots. As you can see, it's possible to express some significant detail with this technique, and because these are black and white images, no grayscale, they can be copied over and over with little change in quality. As with all technical drawings of this type, it is less about artistic skill and more about taking many, many, many measurements. One last point. Um, generally, in artifact illustration, we imagine that light is cast on the object from the upper left. A final kind of stone artifact that technically would be considered a variation of ground stone, but is treated entirely differently, are the big stone monuments, so stelae and altars, that you see when you visit some of the larger sites all around the Maya area. The stela in the drawing on the slide is from the site of Notch Tun, Guatemala. As you can see, the image is complex, and a photo just doesn't do it justice. Because the goal here is to show details of the design, including any writing that may be on it, rather than form, as was the case with the statues in the previous slide, the drawing here, while still black and white, makes use of lines. Again, the rule here is measure, 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 and then measure some more. In most respects, bone and shell is illustrated in the same way as ground stone, making use of thousands upon thousands of tiny dots pr to produce a black and white drawing, again, with an imaginary light source coming from the top left, and with measurement upon measurement. In this case, the drawing on the slide is of part of a bone pendant or mask carved from a human skull and found at the site of Pak Bitun in the Kayo district. The line drawing in the upper left indicates where the illustrated bits originally came from. One of the great things about drawings like this is that they allow us to reconstruct a broken object and to show it in a way that no photo would be able to. The section of skull rolled out flat and illustrated here to see the whole thing at once was found in a bunch of tiny pieces, which have been stitched together, so to speak, through the drawing, drawing process. In it, you can see places where holes have been drilled, where lines have been abraded, and where some spots on the surface of the object are more worn than others. Stippling, all the little dots, is a great way of showing texture. And then there are ceramics, pottery. Traditionally, drawings of vases, bowls, dishes, plates, etc. follow the same basic rules of drawing in black and white. No color, no grayscale, with light shining down on the object from the upper left, and drawn using measurement upon measurement. 
Traditionally, at least in the Americas, a vessel is drawn with an imaginary cut or section of the vessel on the left-hand side, and the outside of the vessel drawn on the right-hand side. The Brits do this differently. They flip it. What can I say? They drive on the wrong side of the road, and they draw on the wrong side of the page. Generally, stippling all the little dots are used to illustrate areas that are unslipped or unpainted or where these substances have worn off. Most drawings of plain water jars or simple bowls will be drawn in this way. Areas of paint or slip and the different colors involved are indicated with different line patterns and fills, as in the drawing at the top, that vary from region to region and according to the dominant colors that tend to appear on pottery. These conventions still dominate and offer the most universality with respect to publication and presentation. Modern technology, however, offers some interesting opportunities to vary on these conventions, as in the drawing on the lower right of a dish from Toledo District, where color can be incorporated. Again, to flog a dead horse, the choices you make depend on the audience, purpose of the drawing, and technology available. Now, because pottery is some of the most commonly illustrated material in the archaeology of the Maya area, I figured we could quickly go over in a step-by-step -step fashion the process of making a drawing. The first step is to simply plan your illustration. What are you drawing? How will it best fit on your page? Next, add all the important information, title, date, your name, a scale that you're going to draw to. Remember, archaeological illustration is a tool, not an art. Without this information, all you have is a pretty picture, usually of a broken object. We're going to be drawing a bowl from the side. The first step is to demarcate the diameter of the vessel, the distance from edge to edge on the rim, across the center of the opening of the vessel from the top. Once you know how big around the opening of the bowl is, draw it as a straight line at the top of your drawing. Next. Holding the vessel at stance, meaning flat in the position it would naturally sit in while on your table, um, and sometimes you have to use your imagination a bit if you only have part of a broken pot, um, measure how tall it would have stood. Draw this as a vertical line in the center of your illustration, coming down from the top line. This will divide the imagined section of your drawing on the left from the detailed representation of the outside of your vessel on the right. Again, holding the pot or sherd at stance, use a contour gauge or carpenter's comb or profile gauge, there are lots of names for this thing, to record the external shape of the pot. You just kind of push the comb up against the pot and the pins will move. You can find these tools in most well-appointed hardware stores, and they're usually used to copy the complex shapes of decorative trims. Transfer this to the left side of your drawing, just trace it. Complete the profile on the left-hand side by taking measurements at various points along the shirt with a ruler or set of calipers and transfer that to your drawing. Flip the outside of your profile to the right side of your drawing, the dotted line on the slide, um, to give an impression of the complete shape of the vessel. In this case, Jane Schmain only has a small fragment or shirt of the pot so she makes the decision not to interpret what the rest of the pot looks like and to just illustrate the shirt she has in its appropriate position on the pot. In this case, the shirt is flat enough to just trace, so she lines it up with the top line of her drawing, representing the rim, and traces around the shirt. Then, with measurement after measurement, she copies over the design on the shirt, with black paint drawn using solid black fills, and red paint drawn using diagonal line fills. We'll finish by taking you through this one last time with a slightly more complicated example. First, plan the layout of your drawing. We're going to draw a top view as well this time, so Joe Schmo, our fictional artist on this one, decides to orient his page vertically. Add the important information, measure the vessel diameter and add your top line, Put the vessel at stance and measure how tall it is. Transfer this to your drawing as a vertical line. 
Use a carpenter's comb or similar tool to copy the outside shape of your vessel and transfer it to the left side of the drawing. Take additional measurements as necessary and complete the profile or section drawing. Imagine that you've cut the pot in half and are looking at it from the side. Transfer the form over to the right side of your drawing and fill in the details of the vessel shape. Taking measurements as necessary with calipers or a ruler, transfer any painted decoration onto your drawing. In this case, we also have some interesting stuff going on inside. So following the same process of measuring and copying, draw what you see and use the appropriate symbols to indicate color. Bob's your uncle. You're done. All right, I think that covers the basics. Um, we hope that you are inspired to give archaeological style illustration a shot. Um, or if you're an artist, we hope that you better understand why archaeologists have made the choices that they have when producing their drawings. If you're interested in following up on some of the topics that we covered in this presentation, check out the books listed here. Um, Google is also a wonderful source. If you have any questions or are looking for any direction, feel free to give us a shout at our project email, scrap.archie at gmail.com. Cheers, and happy drawing.